Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our opening prayer this morning is from Tom Thompson. I'm sorry, our opening prayer this morning is not from Tom over there in Colorado, but it's from Craig Kennedy in Florida, where he's a, a little bit cold this morning. But Craig, warm us up with a prayer. Thank you, Bart. Let us pray. Father God, we just praise you, Lord. We praise you for your unconditional love. We praise you and thank you for your word that we can spend time in it and that it will draw us closer to you. Heavenly Father, I just want to lift up all the folks that are on the street, Lord God, from New England all the way to Florida and across this nation. It's been incredibly cold. We pray that you would protect them and give them shelter. And we also want to pray for the agriculture here in Florida, Lord, that the citrus trees would survive. We just praise you, Jesus, for all that you do for us. Thank you for this time. Calm our hearts and give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Craig. And now we're going to have Heather get us started with a beautiful song, no doubt. Good morning, house family. Uh, this morning I'll be singing two songs. One's old school, one's a little bit more modern, but please join me in worship. It's beginning to rain. Hear the voice of my father. He's saying that whosoever will come drink of his water. He's promised to pour his spirit out on his sons and his daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, look up to the sky. It's beginning to rain. It's beginning to rain. Hear the voice of the Father. He's saying that whosoever will come drink of his water. He's going to pour his spirit out on his sons and his daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, look up to the sky. It's beginning to rain. And Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the mind clay. You've set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you. I need you, though my world may fall. I'll never let you go, my Savior, my closest friend. I will worship you until the very end. And I will worship you until the very end. So beautiful. Thank you, Heather. I also wanted to congratulate you, all three of you, on your retirement, the newest retiree of the Army. Hey, Thank Aaron, I, I have a question for you, Aaron. Sure. Are you going to let your hair grow out a little? <laughs> um, probably not, but I am going to let this grow out. <laughs> Long beard. <laughs> oh, can't wait. Can't wait. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Heather. That was yeah. really beautiful. All right. Craig, would you lead us in a prayer time now? 
like to start before Craig continues in the prayer time with our word for this week, its story. Ponder this. Only when his story intersects with our story are we prepared to share the story. The two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them. Did they do the prayer? Just be mindful that we have a story to share if Jesus is in our lives. Just had uh, to share with others. Finger, you know, from. Oh, oh, there they are. You can, Pat, would you mute yourselves? Okay, so let's come before the Lord in our prayer time. We want to praise the Lord for House Church DRC, which just started this month in the home of Flavian and Naomi in Goma, DRC. I want to pray for God's healing of Joan's daughter, Lacey, whose arm was injured from a partial dislocation. I want to pray for Aaron and Heather Frazier, who just retired from the Army. Well done, faithful servants. For, for a good start, of ministry team to support House Church and Disciples International. And some prayers to the Lord. For a complete end to the COVID-19 pandemic and all its variants worldwide. For, for Malawians in village areas who lost their homes, crops, livelihood to Cyclone Anna. For tension on the Ukraine border with Russia to be resolved through diplomacy and cooperation. For Flavian and Naomi as they join with family members in another city to grieve the loss of a loved one. For success in Pete Proctor's upcoming hip surgery on February 3rd and complication-free recovery. For complete healing of friend's son, Daniel, who will enter drug and alcohol rehabilitation facility on February 2nd. For my friend Ronnie, as he continues to go through rehabilitation treatment facility in Florida for drug addiction. For Heidi's friend, who just started the process of rehab to recovery full, fully through the course of her treatment. For the continued healing of Tom's daughter, Ashley, as also other family members who are recovering from COVID. For Mary O'Flaherty from the Navy Academy who injured her arm and is concerned that she may require surgery. For the Frazier's upcoming move to Texas, following their recent retirement with God's intervention in the details. For Jacob, Alan and Jonathan Miranda to pass their physical for the military service assignment following graduation, especially for Jacob to get blood draw for testing tomorrow and medical personnel were unable to do last week. For Jason Miranda, who is applying for the internship through the Human Biology Department at Stanford University, California. For everyone involved in House Church to invite others to join us when we gather for fellowship and worship on Sundays. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. From thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Craig. Jeremiah, would you read the scripture for us, buddy? Okay. 
The first reading comes from John 1, verses 1 through 5. And 14. And 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, he, was, he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, and the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Oh, Bart, you... you're on mute. Thank you, Jeremiah. Thomas in Germany, and thank you, Heather, for noting. <laughs> Uh, Thomas in Germany is going to have the second reading, but I want us just to look at those words that were read by Jeremiah. These are the first five verses of John's gospel. They correspond to the first five verses of the Bible in Genesis. This, folks, is the story where all subsequent stories follow. This is God's story. God desires that his story would become your story and mine, and the story of the world. Thomas? Acts 22, 3 through 8. I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in the city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strict manners of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are to this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to the prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed down towards Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Well, that story does not end there, but it continues from there. And when his story becomes our story, we do have a story to tell others. Well, before we get into the storytelling, I want to take a poll for us to take a poll together. And it is about stories. So I'm pulling the poll up right now and you can see favorite literature genres. Okay. Now, Literature, whether it's presented in a book or in literature on the stage or in a movie, your favorite genre, just put it down. Is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? Is it science fiction? Is it romance? Is it mystery? What is your favorite? Now, as you're responding, I did not go online to find out what most people prefer, although my wife did, and she found out that romance is way high on the list. Now, I don't know any <laughs> guy friends that I have that read much romance, but uh, let's see how high that might rate on the list. I think we might have everybody in now. So here is the results of the poll. Look at that. Romance didn't even score. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Mystery, uh, I thought, might be a little bit higher nonfiction, which is my preference too, was the highest with more than half of you responding saying you prefer nonfiction. Very interesting. Nonfiction are those 
real life stories. In fact, Dawn and I just watched one last night. I would highly recommend it to you. My grandson and I, we read books and talk about them. We just finished a very long one on Istanbul. It was his choice, not mine. But this next one is my choice. And it's on Wilbur Wilberforce from England, who is credited for ending slavery in England. And the movie Amazing Grace is an amazing story, and it's very well done. So we watched that last night. It was a story, a true story. And whenever I watch a story on TV that says uh, a true story or inspired by a true story, I always follow up by uh, checking out, well, how much of it was really actual? Yeah, because I want it to be true. So it's, it's stories. Okay, now, I have a story for you. Oh, are your ears perking up? Whenever somebody comes and says, I have a story for you, don't you perk up? Don't you like to hear stories? Of course, especially true stories. Well, I have a big, fat, juicy story for you. Now you're really ready, aren't you? Might be even one of those romance stories. <laughs> No, what I have for you today is I have a story that will change your life. You ever heard a story like that? Do you believe stories can actually change your life? Well, believe it, because not only can they, but they do. I mean, think of it. If somebody asks you the question, hey, tell me your story. And by the way, I don't find that that happens routinely, but I love it when folks ask me, hey, tell me your story. Tell me about yourself. Not just what are your plans for today, but tell me about you. Well, if I'm telling my story, and I'll tell a little bit of it today, um, or you are telling yours, bear in mind, our stories are really just a collection of stories from others. We're full of stories, our lives. When we are born, we are born into a story. It's the story of someone else, whoever those parents were, or whether you're adopted, whatever they are, by the time you were old enough to understand what was going on around you, you were experiencing someone else's story. And in many cases, their story became your story. I mean, think about it, for better or worse. I don't know what your upbringing was. Mine was, mine was pretty good. And uh, as far as I knew, I mean, relating to others around me, I thought, well, you know, my parents love me. I have brothers and sisters that seem to love me most of the time, unless we're fighting. And you know what that's like. But those stories impact us. And some of those stories go deep and they shape our lives. Uh, have you ever been told, oh, you're just like your mother or you're just like your father? And they don't necessarily mean that in a nice way, or maybe they do. But whatever the case may be, we are like those that have impacted our lives deeply, personally. The same is true with God. God has stories to tell. In fact, our lives begin with us entering into his story. Now, I'm not just talking about the stories that are codified here in this book of really 66 stories compiled into an old and a new covenant as they are given to us. No, I'm talking about the story that God has for us from the very, very beginning. Yeah, it's the story that we enter into. It's life. I'm looking outside right now. I see snow and it's beautiful with the trees. That's his story out there. We have the Webb telescope now about a million miles from Earth orbiting. It's all arrayed. They spent, I don't know, it was something like $10 billion on this thing. And I'm excited about it. But it's like, gosh, isn't that a waste of money? No, no. Why? Because scientists want to know the story, the first story, how it all began. Isn't that exciting? Well, mark my words, here's what they're going to find out they're going to find out that it all began in the way that they already suspect, which is recorded in Genesis. And that is in the beginning, light. God created the heavens and the earth. There was light. It all happened. So that's the story unfolding around us. We're in that story, but not all of us 
are affected personally by the story. It's kind of like, think of God's story as this glass of water, everything in it, the water. That's his story. It's the world around us, the universe around us. And when we are born, we enter into his story, so to speak. And the way God would have it be, and much the way it has been for us in the lives of uh, the people around us, our parents and teachers and friends and people that have a, a, we have allowed to get really close to us and us close to them, they've affected us. And when that happens with God, as it's meant to, as he desires, it's kind of like, here's us, this little sugar cube. We enter into God's story, our story, his story goes in there. Now, this cube is just right there, but what God desires is for us to, uh, through the experiences of life, experience him. And you'll see this story. I don't know. Can you see? The cube, it looks like it's dissolving. It's like the water is gotten into the cube and the cube into the water and they're all mixed together. Now, bear in mind, this is still God's story, and our story is in his story, and not the same. You see, no matter how much I mix these two together, they will never be the same. Water is always the water, and the sugar is now dissolved, but it's still sugar within the story, but it's been entirely affected. God wants to entirely affect our lives. C.S. Lewis would call it the good infection. But some people are like this, a sugar cube, it's our life, but we have so protected ourselves from the stories of others to include God that we go in. We don't even go in, we kind of float on top. And no matter what happens, there is no change. It's kind of going through life and experiencing the stories of others, reading those stories, but they really don't change your life. They don't impact your life. You may believe certain things, but there's no change. There's no difference. That difference really happens, if you will, when we get naked before God, when we get naked before others. I'm talking about spiritually naked, emotionally naked, when we open ourselves up much deeper than just a physical disclosure, that's easy. And isn't it interesting when God created the first human being and that human being sinned, went their own way against God, they tried to cover themselves up, protect themselves, hide themselves, kind of like this. It doesn't work very well, but we do it to isolate us from God. We are embarrassed. And God says, no, I don't want you to be that way. Not only does God want us to be that way with him, he wants us to be that way with one another in Christ, but only because we can trust one another with what we share with one another, those stories going deep. And when God's story enters into our story, when we share our story, we can share his story too. And that is what's going on in chapter 22 of Acts. Paul has the opportunity to share his story. And with his story, God's story. Let's see how that unfolds. It's not the first time or the only time in Acts where Paul is sharing his story. He's shared it all through three missionary journeys now. Three times for years he's been gone. And when he has shared the story in the past, some people get it. And his story becomes their story. His life intersects with their lives. And God's life intersects with theirs. And then others, not so. In fact, in many places, he's kicked out of town by his own people, by those who reject him because they reject the story he is telling. They've already got their own version and not his. So Paul, who has been advised not to go to Jerusalem, but is going because he's compelled by the Spirit, advised not to go because there are people that oppose him. But he says, God's called me to go. And so he goes. And he's going with the same purpose that he has always had. He says, I don't know what awaits me there, except that, uh, you know, troubles and being bound and 
in prison perhaps, uh, but he is going with the same mission and calling that he had from the very beginning. Share the good news. Some will hear it and some won't. But I'm calling you to share the good news. So he shows up, as we talked about last week, and he's misunderstood even before he gets there. And so with the uh, guidance of the Jerusalem Council, he's trying to make sure that he isn't misunderstood, but correctly uh, you know, interpreted. Our lives are always being interpreted by those around us. And sometimes they're getting it right and sometimes they're not. And it's very frustrating when we're misunderstood. As I said before last week, it's bad enough to be understood, let alone misunderstood. Well, he is. And it almost costs him his life, as we talked about last week. And as you can see in chapter 21, he finds himself there being protected by the Roman commander and the battalion there that is guarding the uh, what we call today the temple precincts and back then where the temple was erected and so paul communicates in greek to the commander he wants the opportunity to speak to these people so that they will give him an opportunity to be heard. There is a crowd there that thinks all kinds of different things about him. There are people that have shown up that are no doubt believers. They're just there because they were there. There are other that are opposing him. There are Romans there, there are Gentiles, there's Jews. It's a mixed crowd and they all think what they all think. And he wants to get it right. And so he asks permission to speak to them. So imagine thousands of people up there being protected by hundreds of Roman soldiers where there's a commander. Isn't it interesting? Paul has called to bring the message. And here he is to a big audience that he didn't put together. But there they are. They're a hostile audience for the most part. But when he waves to them with the Roman commander there, they settle down a little bit. And then he does something very interesting, very important. And it's all about how we tell our stories. Let's be careful and be mindful when we're telling our stories who the audience is. Let's connect with them where they're at, not expect them to connect with us with where we're at, wherever that may be. Let's meet them where they, that's what God does in Christ. The greatest story of all that's ever been told is Jesus Christ, the word of God, the word of God come into the world. And he speaks to us in our language in our form, and he meets us where we're at, and so does Paul. So he has just spoken to the Roman commander in Greek, because that's what the Roman commander speaks, and he addresses him and connects with him there. But now with this audience, he speaks to them in Aramaic, which is the Hebrew dialect that was spoken. It was the words that the way that Jesus spoke, and when he does that, everybody gets quiet, because Wow, he's speaking in Aramaic. Whoever, well, the Roman commander thought he was an Egyptian. You know, whatever other people think he is, now they know he speaks Aramaic. And he opens with giving his background. That's a good place to start. Give your background. Give them some context. Before you get into somebody else's story, even God's story, start with yours. Let them get to know you a little bit. You know, get personal have a cup of coffee together paul couldn't do that there not then but he addresses them in their language and then he gives his background but he opens with these words fathers brothers when they hear this they're thinking this guy is addressing us as one of our own as fathers brothers the jewish faith he is connecting with his jewish heritage and the people for the most part, there are Jewish, and so now they're really settling down. And he gives his background from there. He says, I am a Jew. I'm a Jew like you. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia. They don't know where that is, modern day Turkey, but it's no small city. It's a significant city. So now he's giving his background. I'm born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but raised in this city, Jerusalem educated under Gamaliel. Gamaliel, in the strictest sense of keeping the law. And I am zealous for God, just as you are today. Look at all those points of connection as he gives his background. Here's where I'm from. I'm Jewish. 
I'm raised in, born in Tarsus, but I'm raised in Jerusalem. He didn't grow up in Jerusalem. He grew up his formative years in Tarsus. But when he was probably bar mitzvahed, about 13, he was sent to Jerusalem where he grew up under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the son of Hillel, one of the greatest Jewish teachers of all time. They knew who he was. This is quite a reputation, you know, that Paul has. Strictly, according to the law, in another place, Paul says, and maybe even said it here, though not recorded, I am a Pharisee of Pharisees. His father was. And if he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, I guess his grandfather was. He has that lineage. He is really connected, zealous for the law, just as they are. Now, for me, my story, if I'm sharing with people, well, I'm an American. Okay, now I've connected with those that are American. I know that we have, for instance, the Reedsons in Malawi who are not American, but they understand me in a particular way that I relate to them personally and also with Flavian and Naomi and DRC, but I am American. I was born in New Jersey. Now, if you're American, you can already relate to me. If you were born or been even through New Jersey, you can relate to me there, but I was raised in Kansas. Oh, I've been through Kansas. Um, and my tradition that I was raised in, religious tradition, was Catholic. Now, if you're Catholic, you can relate to that. I have two brothers and two sisters. I was raised in a family that we all seemed to really love each other, but religion was just something that we did on Sunday. Maybe you can relate to that. I'm just giving you some of my background. This is my story. This is not necessarily all who I am, but it's just my background. I was raised in that tradition all the way going through high school, and um, I was straight as an arrow kind of a kid. I followed, you know, what my folks gave me to do. I didn't really write outside the lines in life too much. I guess I was considered to be very morally straight all the way through high school and on into college when I went on from there. So... Paul goes on from there with his story. And what follows then is who I was. You see, as our story unfolds, there's a past and a present and a future that is unfolding. So after he gives his background, he says, this is who I was. I was a persecutor of the way. The way is a reference to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. The way that people talked about the Christian was the way. And they understood that, and he did, so he used that. I persecuted the way, even to the point of death. I was putting people to death, arresting them, putting them in prison. That's who I was. That's part of your story. People need to hear it. Well, part of my story was who I was, was a kid who graduated from high school and went to college, and things changed. Um, I became infected, if you will, with the college scene, way of life. I, you know, uh, have thought ever since then and shared this with my children, you, you need to decide the kind of person you want to be, find people like that and hang around them, because that's the kind of person you're going to be. Well, I wasn't thinking that way. I just happened to be moving in with a bunch of guys into a fraternity house. And I became the, the life of the party. It was back in the animal house days, hazing days, when you did a lot of things that were pretty crazy. And I knew this was not my moral code that I was brought up with. And, I, and so I was playing two parts. I was becoming this party animal, getting into a lot of drinking and other stuff that really shaped me. And it became a part of my story. That's who I was. And I can confirm it just as Paul goes on to confirm it. He's not just saying, he says, hey, this is who I was. I was a persecutor of the way. I took people to prison. And the high priest can testify to that. And the council and the elders, they gave me letters to go even as far as Damascus to arrest people and take them and put them into prison. That's who I was. And he confirms it with that background. Well, I can confirm it too. In fact, one of the people tuning in right now is Mike Heimer, who is my friend when I was a kid, you know, still in high school in New Jersey and in uh, junior high school, as a matter of fact, a, a closer friend even of my brother at that time. But my, Mike knows the way I was back then. 
but we had been out of touch for a long time. And when I went to college, Mike wasn't in the picture, but others were. I could call upon some of them. I could uh, call upon my friend, uh, well, it's been a long time now, Denny Hudson. We had a, a room, our room was the uh, third room on the second floor, and we called it Club 32. It was a three-man room, but a four-man room, but there were only three of us in the fourth uh, stall for the um, for our stuff became a wet bar. It had all kinds of musical stuff, and it was a it was a uh, it was a bar in the fraternity. Uh, and he could attest to that. That's the person that I was through college. Well, Paul's story goes on, and what's really fascinating is something happens, and that's exactly the way he words it. And then it happened. I gave you my background. You heard Paul's. I gave you who I was. You heard Paul's. And then Paul says, then it happened. Something happened. I was on my way to Damascus. And then a light shined all around me. And I heard this voice coming out of heaven. It was speaking to me. It said, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? I said, who are you? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, those who were with me, they saw the light. They can testify to that. They heard the voice, the sound anyway, but they didn't discern the voice. And so I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, enter into the city and I'll tell you what to do. It happened. It happened to me while I was on an airplane on my first assignment going to Guam from Hawaii, all by myself, thinking about my life, reflecting over who I was or had been and where I was going and a new world, a new life, a new career unfolding. And I went down the list and I thought, man, I'm pretty proud of a lot of things that I've done and not so proud of a lot of other things. I wonder what's next. Something's missing is what I remember thinking. Then I landed and a man met me. His name was Joe. I was gonna be taking his job. We sat in the car, BOQ, picked me up at the airport. We were talking and he mentioned that uh, he went to church. And I said, can I go with you? It was Saturday. I went with him the next day. And then it happened. It was already happening. Paul goes on when he mentions from there, he was led blind. He was blind. Isn't this fascinating? Isn't this interesting? The light shines and he's blinded. Jesus is the light of the world. He opens our eyes to see. But first, sometimes he blinds us that he may open them. And so it was with Paul. A man named Ananias shows up. Ananias, as Paul says to his audience, he says, he's a devout Jew with a good reputation. He came to me and he said, Saul, receive your sight. And I opened my eyes and I saw him. And he says, God has given you the opportunity to see him and to tell you what he has for you to do. And so it was for me, as I went to church that next day after arriving, and my friend Joe gave me a Bible, and I began to read it in the New Testament, in the stories of Jesus, and my eyes were opened. The light came on. That's how it was for me. And then it was confirmed for me. You see, Paul having this experience, sometimes you wonder, is this really happening? And a guy named Ananias shows up and he confirms that. And a guy like Joe shows up and he confirms some things. And some other people and some other experiences confirmed what was happening was real and was true. And my life changed then. Paul's life changed then. God gave him something to do. And Ananias said it. He is going to send you with his message. Now, be baptized. What prevents you? And so I heard the same thing. Be baptized in the Philippine Sea. No, I had been baptized in the Catholic tradition, but I came to believe in my own study that that was something done for me, not something that I did in response to God and faith. And so... I still have that picture, 
And I had that picture embedded in my mind, not only the photograph of my response after being baptized. That's my story. My life hasn't been the same since. Paul's life wasn't the same since. He was called to bring the message, and he did. I've been called to bring the message as well in the way that God has called me to do so. And you, in the particular way he's called you to bring the message. First, through your life, and then through your words, and they must match together. So then Paul goes on by saying, then I was in Jerusalem, and I was told by this one who called me, this Jesus, leave, leave Jerusalem. They will not listen to you. And he says, but Lord, they know who I am. They know that I'm the one that had persecuted the church. I was even there at the feet of Stephen, where they put my, the cloaks as they stoned him to death. I was that person. I'm not that person. And he's thinking, I think that, Lord, they will listen to me. And God says, no, they won't. Not all of them will listen to you. I am sending you far away to the Gentiles. Now, when he says this, the crowd who's been listening intently to the story, they flip out. They flip out such that they want him dead. They say, away with him, which means we want him dead. And they're trying to kill him. It's the Roman commander who's got him now in custody that takes him away. And just to give you a snippet of what follows, Paul ends up in a serious strait there, which he plays his ace in the whole card, his trump card, so to speak, when he says, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't do this to me. Are you sure you want to? go in that direction. And of course he can't. So what the Roman commander is then going to do is put him before the religious authorities. You see, Paul came to Jerusalem because God wanted him there to tell the story. And he has in the most amazing ways. And he's going to continue to tell it. And that story is going to follow next week. But let's stop right here and consider what you've heard, what I've shared about my story. And hopefully as I've shared my story and you've heard Paul's story, You've been thinking about your story and how you share your story with others and how we do that. Our background. Hey, this is my background. Because when we do that, we connect with people and they with us. That's an important first step. Then you talk about how things used to be, what happened, and how things are now, and why that makes a difference, and how God, when his story has entered into our story, changes our lives. Every Sunday, we experience the very heart of God's story when we participate together in communion. Jesus told that story to his disciples when he did. He said, as often as you do this, remember me. Remember this story. Remember to do this, and so we do. It's the story of God's love poured out on our lives and into our lives that changes our lives through Christ. And isn't it interesting when we partake, if you do, if his story has become your story and changed your life, if Jesus Christ is your Savior, is your Lord, then you're part of his family and we partake of him. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We are in him, he is in us. We are going to consume by faith the life of Christ in ourselves to remember who he is, what he has done, his story, and allow his story then to live through ours. So join me if you are part of his family. As Dawn and I celebrate with you, Remembering that time, that evening, that night in which Jesus was betrayed, and he said to his disciples, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you, but I tell you the truth, I shall not eat it again until I eat it new with you in the kingdom of heaven. And then he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. And as often as you do this, remember me, the body, the life, the love of our Lord.
Then Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood. It is of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. And as often as you do this, remember me. Let us remember the one who never forgets us. The blood, the life of our Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you for sharing your story with us from the moment we were born. It's all around us, the world in which we live and experience life, the way that you have brought your story to us through the stories of others who know you, through your story written down for all ages, all times in the scriptures and by your spirit, Lord, that we wouldn't just know about your story. We would know the story, know you, and you who know us intimately, that we may experience the life that you meant for us now and forever in Christ. Amen. Okay, I purposefully wanted to leave enough time for us to continue with storytelling. We have uh, 20 of us, 20 of us who have tuned in. Most of us, uh, I can see your faces and you can see one another and some not, that's fine. Wh whatever is most comfortable for you. But the stories are already being told. I am in Malawi, Africa. I am in the home of Patrick and Mervis. So are you, you can see them on the stream. I'm over in California. Dawn and I are with the Mirandas. We're with Thomas Scharman in uh, Germany. We are together and we all have stories to tell. You've heard mine, you've heard Paul's. God wants us to share those stories with others. So let's share some now. And here's the question, and then just let the conversation go as we get to know one another more. When did God's story enter into your story and how has it changed your life? You don't have to go into detail, but just kind of share a little bit. When did God's story enter into your story and how has his story changed your life? Okay, I'll take liberty because I'm looking right at you, John Holt, my <laughs> dear friend, and he's looking to his side going, oh, I hate it when he does this. But John, because John has uh, been an attorney throughout his career, and John just retired. How many years, John? Unmute. Yeah. How many years? Not enough. No. <laughs> he mm -hmm. does what he does. Mm -hmm. He's taken cases all the way that have gone up to the Supreme Court level. So uh, by me asking a question like this, you're always asking for testimony, John. Right? Well, well you're, you're right in that. <laughs> Let me say, Bart, the last the last two weeks, uh, 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 a takeaway has been, uh, what is your response? You know, and what was Paul's response? What was uh, Bart's response? And uh, I, I'm I'm going to answer your question, but uh, I, I want us all to come together and give a joint response. Uh, tomorrow is a very special day for a very special lady. <laughs> Don Fiziok's birthday. She'll be 39. <laughs> yeah, yeah she's going to be 39. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> okay, so I want I want us all to sing happy birthday to Don. I'm going to start. Is that okay? And you can take off your mic. We can make a chorus. And uh, three, one, two, three. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> that is the best birthday present I could ever have spending it with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for remembering and starting off this thing. Yeah. <laughs> all right, and that doesn't get, get you off the hook, John. You got to answer. <laughs> you, you know, uh, uh, 
Bart, you always take us places. And Don, let me say this, your story is amazing and has inspired us all and we love you. And uh, 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 just just want to share the joy of, uh, of, of your life and the impact you've had on all of us. So uh, Thank you, there are other people, there are other people yeah. that could speak, but you know, I, I just as I'm first in line, I, I, I just want to say uh, that we travel together and uh, um, uh, we, we say when you travel, you need an angel with you. So uh, my, my spiritual story is really very simple. It's, it's all about angels. Uh, my mother was a, a, a extremely uh, devout woman uh, at her elbow. Uh, I learned um, everything from poetry to, to scripture, to the Psalms. And uh, uh, one of my greatest wishes is just to uh, live and honor, honor my mother and my father, but for the spiritual heritage they gave me. So uh, I, I, it, it wasn't a bright light. Uh, event and experience like that it was much more just a a, a lifelong experience of living in the uh, the light and the shadow of the reflection of the love of God through my parents mm. and um, if uh, let me say this and so what difference has it made in my life uh, I'll be direct and I think if uh, if um, if I had one wish it would be that uh, another person uh, a son, a daughter, family, grandchildren, each of us, other people that I've never known could experience that love. When, when you experience that love, your life is changed uh, in a way that is uh, 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 far more deep, less re restless. Uh, I didn't say easy. My mother at 92, I said, mother, what do I need to know going forward? She said, son, life gets longer, but it never gets easier. So, uh, you know, there are ditches on the side of the superhighway of life either way. And just because we are people of faith doesn't mean that our journey is going to be simple and we're never going to fall in the ditches. But the, the point is, is we know somebody that can get us out of the ditches. So often that's another friend, uh, another uh, person. And so, uh, right, so the bottom line, very simply, is uh, if you want to, if you, uh, when you travel through life, you need an angel. And the flip side of it is, you need to be an angel. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's my story and uh, nice to share it with you and uh, our, our, our group. Thank, that, you. thank you, John. What, what I'm getting from that at the heart of it is the story of God entered into your life through the story of your parents, your mother in particular. And that story was communicated to you and it became your story. Well, I, I certainly hope so. And uh, yeah. I, you know, the, the uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's nice to share about uh, grandmother Rachel. She was a school teacher for 60 some odd years and uh, uh, an absolute beautiful woman and, uh, and my angel. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Thank you, John, for getting us started. Somebody else. I think with, with, with me, I mean, I grew up same as you, Bart, as Catholic. And so I always knew about God. Um, and then I accepted Christ. And I think I was 21, 20, 21 through my brother going to a church that he was going through. But, you know, it, it, it's been um, like John said, you're on the super highway, but you hit a bunch of ditches along the way. Does it mean you're not going to fall in the ditches? So the journey's kind of been up and down, but I think even now, it's just it's just a story that keeps on being added to. It's not something you really came from. It's where on the road you're going, and uh, been on a lot of ups, a lot of downs, um, but feeling God's love the whole way, as John was saying, through friends, a friend to help lift you up. Um, where I became really aware, I think, really because you always knew God's love, but seeing. You know, the growth that my wife has gone through, growth that my boys have gone through, I think just almost reaffirms God. You know, you, you are there. And through them, through my wife, through my sons, it just builds me stronger. And the thought process I have today is a little different than last year. A little different, you know, a little more <clears throat> um, fulfilling than the year before, because now I'm seeing more of a need to share with people before it's like, I'm a Christian. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll tell you about God. I'm not sure. Let me, let me do it when I'm comfortable. 
but I'm starting to realize more now, you know, God never really gives you a comfortable spot. He just gives you a spot. And, um, but you know, the comfort comes from there knowing that maybe the person has heard you or something like that. Yeah. Thank, thank you, David. Thanks. And I know that, uh, that, that there's at least one person that's tuned in whose story uh, has been really influenced by your story. And it's not just the lady on your left. Is that right? Please. Art. Share with us. Oh, just a second, David. We're, we're going to hear from somebody else, but I, I want you to share too. Is that, is that, is that Mary? I think Julie. Julie? Judy, Judy. Okay. Julie, Julie. Julie, you're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Un could you share a little bit, Julie? Unmute yourself. Yeah, I'll unmute Julie. myself. Julie. I'm Julie, and David Miranda is totally influential in my coming to the Lord. He, we were at Round Table Pizza, and he was um, always talking to me about his new church and his Bible study group and invited me to it and from that on um Heidi then was influential in my husband because we went to a different church so they just I know I told you that they have a special place in my heart because without them I don't know where I'd be <laughs> oh, thank, love you guys <laughs> thank, thank you I, I'm, I'm so glad you shared Julie I think last Sunday was your first time to join us uh two two this is my third Sundays time but I've been, and uh I've and been you, had the, you had the pizza place where david was working i think even um heidi was working there too and it was yep. their testimony and witness that they shared christ with you you responded and here yep. all these years later you're living in a different state right wisconsin i think it is yeah yeah wisconsin. and uh and here you are with us that is a fantastic story i know god is good Beautiful. it's awesome <laughs> da David in uh, Molokai, Hawaii. David, you were going to say something, please. So I, uh, like so many of us, was raised Catholic, so I had a mechanical understanding of God and religion. But when I was in high school, I was dating a girl who was younger than me, and her father was a pretty simple man, a farmer, but he, and he didn't want me to date her wise man um and uh so he made this rule that i could see her only once a week but church didn't count so shoot they went to a nazarene church so i ended up there sunday morning sunday evening wednesday evening every time the youth group was doing anything i was there and so i got exposed but quite honestly I was pretty mocking of the whole thing. I would sit in the back of the church and they'd have altar calls and I'd chuckle at these knuckleheads going down there and week after week after week until one week. And I still to this day don't understand it, but I nudged my buddy who was with me to get out of the way. And I felt like I was almost being physically transported out of the pew and down the aisle and knelt at that altar and gave my life to Christ. And it was a, it was a supernatural experience that to this day, I can't quite explain. Mm. But I found out after a couple of years of zealousness that like your sugar cube, mm. if my life, if my story was going to be come part of God's story, there needed to be some stirring. There needed to be somebody pounding on me with a spoon a little bit uh, for my story to dissolve into God's story. And mm -hmm. I think that is, is even true today. I find myself, if you will, coming out of solutions sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the, the sugar cube kind of reforms itself and isn't part of God's story. And it needs to be stirred up a little bit to, uh, to become part of God's story, integrated with God's story. So that's my story. Wow. Thank, thank you for sharing that, David, um, and to, for taking that illustration that I shared in a very personal way. Uh, you know, if, if I poured out the water on the floor uh, and let it just evaporate, mm -hmm. the salt sugar would be left, and I could scoop it back up and reform it into a, a block, and it would be like, okay, so what happened here? Um, God intends us to remain in his story, in solution, 
so to speak, um, allowing him to um, be in every part mm -hmm. of our lives. He already knows every part of our lives. So why not just rest in him? So I'm going to stop at this point. But the good news is next week when we continue, it will be another story that Paul is telling. It'll be a different uh, presentation to a different audience. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to do more of this next time. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Heidi, yes. <clears throat> Can I just tell a quick story? Absolutely. Well, I don't know how quick it. I'll try. Okay. <clears throat> On Monday, a week ago, tomorrow, we found out that this very, very um, popular. Right, he's the number one wrestler in the country. What weight is he? One ninety-seven. He's one hundred ninety-seven pounds, and he wrestled Jason's buddy at Stanford. And mm. there was a lot of. He's a very, very. Oh, I'll use the word cocky wrestler he's italian his name's aj ferrari and he is like a superstar for like young wrestlers throughout the country i mean we saw him in action he like won he's kissing his uh, muscles i mean he was talking smack up to my friends my son's friend before the match like i'm gonna swipe your the mat up with your body i'm gonna make you cry like a baby i mean he he's like oh he has everything everything his looks he has money he has talent he is well known in the wrestling world he's number one and he goes to oklahoma state university i think so but anyway he got in a horrific car accident on monday horrific he was uh they, and he's been shown on his instagram to be driving 130 miles an hour taping that on his instagram he was with another wrestler oh uh Cross country player, rather. He was with another athlete, not a wrestler, another athlete driving from an event, a youth event where he was probably there to be a celebrity type thing, driving and passing cars on a one, you know, no pass zone up a hill on a, on a curve on a mountain. And he hits a woman and uh, they crash and roll, and his car caught on fire. And he had to, uh, the, the boy next to him actually escaped the car through the windshield all cut up really i mean it they had a miracle and uh some people stopped and it happened to be the football coach i believe at from the high school or from the college or maybe the high school local high school and another man showed up and you can look this up you can look up aj ferrari car accident and in oklahoma and a man showed up a big huge man speaking to them uh, how to get aj out of this car and then this man disappeared. No one knows who he was. Um, I'm going to show you the car. AJ had an absolute miracle. And I just thought about how, you know, on the road to Damascus, and if we could just think of AJ and how God is going to be working in his life. And maybe mm -hmm. this is the mm -hmm. beginning of the story of where God and AJ for our meet. Thank, so. thank you. Thank you for sharing that. See, it's all stories. And you've just shared a story of someone else and how maybe God will use that story to change their lives and other lives through those stories. So here's our ongoing assignment. Let's share our stories with others. Let's invite others to participate in our stories, our lives, and the stories of others. If you invite someone here, like Julie is here, first time just a couple of weeks ago, through the invitation of uh, the Mirandas, and she's experiencing your stories, and we're experiencing hers. If that's a good thing, Julie, and I think it is, well, maybe others are looking for this kind of an experience, a life experience together. So with that, let's look forward to more coming up. But in the meantime, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and a good story all week long. God bless you all. Love y'all. See you next Bye, Bart. time. Bye, Bart. Happy Bye, birthday, John. Be blessed. Yeah, happy birthday.